Uh, hello, my name is Matthew, and I just finished reading At Swim Two Birds by Flan O'Brien. Uh, I was just talking about this in another video, and I cannot tell you how much I loved this. I've read it before, but how much I loved reading it again. It was so fun. And with this particular edition, you really do start smiling straight away. Uh, it has a blurb. <laughs> it, this is on the cover of the book. And it says, uh, This is just the book to give your sister if she's a loud, dirty, boozy girl by Dylan Thomas, <laughs> no less. Um, and so this is a uh, modernist Irish novel. And the premise, the story, is um, a young student who is living with his father and he's lazy. All he does is he stays up in his locked room lying in bed all day uh, for nearly the whole duration of the book. Uh, he would rather just be uh, <laughs> uh, sleeping in bed and daydreaming and idling much to his father's chagrin, who um, wants him to be a student and to be studious, um, but he wants him working on his studies. He wants him uh, in the drawing room or in the study, um, out in the main portion of the house, uh, with pens and paper, books around him, actively uh, working on his subject matter, not locked up in his room where he's pretending uh, to be studying or uh, even worse uh, pretending to be at school so locking the door and um, thinking that his father um, will believe oh he must be at school right now he's at classes uh, while he's just sleeping in bed and uh, the father and the son have these terrific um, conversations of just a, a disappointed father and a wise-cracking, youthful, um, um, kind of upstarty um, young student. The idea of, well, I'm, I'm so bright, I have so many uh, great ideas, uh, I, I can't even contain them, that, that, that kind of uh, wishful thinking that you might find in a precocious uh, but lazy young student. And what happens with all of this daydreaming is that we get uh, the stories, the imagination, the characters that are all swirling around uh, this student's um, mind. And these stories start pouring out. And uh, we, we go from his interior, his imagination, back to waking up uh, from his daydreams and talking to his father and talking to other people that are coming in and out of the house and then uh, back to his daydreaming. And we move back and forth with this. And reading it again after so long, one of the main impressions that I have uh, with the book is actually the, the feeling of youthfulness. Um, and I, I was a little, um, there was a part of me that was wondering, um, how am I going to take this book after, you know, maybe reading it in my early 20s and now I'm uh, nearly 40? Uh, there's some books that can feel age appropriate. Um, On the Road by Kerouac might make an impression, a positive one, if you're 17 or 18 years old, early 20s. Um, it certainly will not make the same impression uh, if you're rather settled down in your 40s or 50s or 60s. Um, a really bad comparison would be uh, the youthfulness that you can find in something like Tom Sawyer, opposed to other books that aren't quite youthful but are juvenile, when, when you go back to them and they 
have an adolescent quality. This book does not. It just feels lively and fun. Um, and the, all the modern, modernist elements that you might think about, the quality of the language, the strangeness of the storytelling, it all folds in so naturally. Uh, Flann O'Brien creates the, the rules of the world and then, uh, to my mind, uh, follows his own rules. And so what's interesting is that uh, when you go into his imagination and you're reading these stories, there's a, a fantastic ongoing story about a puka which uh, obviously reminded me of uh, one of my favorite mo movies, uh, Harvey, with uh, Jimmy Stewart, where um, um, L. L. Wood P. Dowd uh, is friends with a six-foot-one tall rabbit uh, who turns out to actually, uh, invisible, uh, turns out to actually be a puka, which is a, a mythological... I can't remember if it's Irish or not, but this mythological um, sprightly spirit. And so uh, we have this story with uh, a puka and uh, supernatural elements. It has the feeling of um, Irish folklore or um, medieval tales. Um, and the feeling of mythology and supernatural elements. And it's a, a story being told. And while here, we're, we're reading a novel and it's a story. And so there's super, super um, supernatural elements and mythology. And we get these levels where it feels um, logically consistent. Um, the humor is so spot on and natural and easy and hilarious. Um, some of the modernist elements, which I thought were um, executed so well, is you'll get maybe 50 pages into the book and then there'll be a section that'll say, um, here's, gonna, here's a summary um, in case you're just starting now. Um, and for a contemporary comparison, it would be like uh, turning on the television and there's a commercial. And when the program starts, uh, it would give you a little recap to let you know you're in the middle of a show. Here's what happened. Now back to the show. Um, or, or a little cheat in case you're trying to skip ahead and the author is knowingly saying, uh, let's catch you up really quickly. Um, and then even more hilariously, um, maybe a hundred pages later or something, um, it'll say, refer back to this page um, for the summary for what uh, will help you when you go back uh, to where you are to read. Uh, and so it's referring back to uh, uh, re read this and that'll help you if you're uh, just starting now, which is just grand. Um, and the, um, the plot, or the meat of it, is the idea that um, he's in bed so often, just daydreaming, and these imaginary characters start having a real life of their own, and the imaginary characters prefer uh, if our young student spends more time asleep than awake. The father wants him awake and active more than he's asleep. And the imaginary characters uh, find a way uh, to drug the student uh, to keep him in this daydreaming state so they could uh, live their imaginary lives. And it's outlandish and it's zany and out there and all of those things. But uh, very much like in, in the same way that um, if you buy into the fact that a man just just woke up as a cockroach, we'll accept that and move on with the story. It's just like that. We're going to accept all of these things 
and then just have a great story. Um, two parts I want to mention is that it's not just all zany and funny and inventive. It, it, it is all those things. But there are parts that are uh, touching and beautiful. And so I just wanted to read uh, one line, if I'm at the right spot, um, which I, I just, uh, I, I marked it because it was just uh, so lovely. And it's a few lines about friendship. Nothing can be compared to the faithful friend, and no weight of gold and silver is able to countervail the goodness of his fidelity. I just love. Um, one of the similarities that I saw with the textual language um, in this book in comparison to uh, Beckett um, is I absolutely love when an author uh, done, done well uh, will overly describe a situation, will get so exacting uh, where it becomes absurd. So the idea of describing somebody walking down the street and, and having to give the additional details. They lifted their legs up and down. Uh, one of the examples in this book was um, a sugar bowl being passed and having the hilarious additional detail that it was a sugar bowl that was filled with sugar that was passed across the table. Things like that just kill me. Um, and the last thing was just a moment, um, very rarely in a book, um, very rarely ever when I'm reading, do I truly laugh out loud. It happens. They're the, the best moments. Uh, usually when I talk about things being funny, I'm kind of internally giggling to myself, chuckling, guffawing. Uh, but this is a moment where... Um, I did just start laughing and lifted my head away from the page. And so it's these people and they're talking about um, Homer and uh, the Iliad. And they're talking about storytelling and we finally get all the way back to Homer and uh, the Iliad and how um, it was written so long ago and people are still reading it today, that, that kind of thing. And they come to the, that, um, I, I, I suppose, like apocryphal idea that um, Homer was a blind man. Um, as far as I know, that there, that's, there, there's no truth, no, no fact to that, but I, I've heard that too. Um, <clears throat> and so they're talking about uh, blind people, and, oh gosh, I hope I didn't lose it. Did I lose my page? Uh, well, I can't find it. Uh, and they're talking about, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, they're talking about how blind people are these good storytellers. And so uh, somebody, in reference to uh, Homer, someone mentions uh, uh, like a neighboring friend and how the train, the train's going by. Can you hear that? <laughs> um, and they're saying, uh, oh, you know, these blind people, they're, they're, they're good yarners. These, these, blind, these blind people are good yarners. And somebody says, uh, well, is it true that so-and-so was blind? I, I knew that he wore black glasses. And he says, oh, so-and-so, from the day of his birth, he never had a light in his head. <laughs> Something like that. I wish I had the page and I wish the train uh, didn't uh, ruin the rhythm of my timing. But um, it was just so funny. Um, talking about a blind person saying, from the day of his birth, he never had a light in his head. Uh, which I thought was hilarious. Uh, I'm sorry about the train, if you're still watching. Um, those are some of my thoughts. Just a great fun, um, 
enjoyable read. I'm so happy I reread it. Uh, At Swim to Birds by Flan O'Brien. Uh, let me know if you've read it. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, please leave a comment if you would like. Uh, Andy's going to keep sleeping. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Take care.